Howdy. Yo. Hey, uh, Nazi kickers off. Adolf uh, Rosenwalder or whatever stupid name. Yeah, I saw that. that. <laughs> are, you let, are you letting us in or is it like... I let you in there, yeah. Okay. I think I think I think security's back up. Ooh, good. Although I uh, I don't see I don't see Taylor here. It said he joined, but I don't see him. Yeah, but is it through that invite you sent before? This is the invite I sent before. Okay. Don't don't. Mm. <laughs> Bill, busy day today. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Spent a lot of time outside. It's nice. It's beautiful out. I bought uh, uh, PGA 2K21 too, so I've been trying to, trying to play that for a little while. It was a beautiful day out, but I've been playing video games all day. I didn't say all day. I spent most of the day outside, cleaned my car, did a lot of reading outside, Ooh. did some running. Wait, none of that, none of that is true. <laughs> you didn't do any running. Yeah. How far did you run? Not far today, but usually I do like anywhere between three or five miles. I try to walk more. I can't really run so much, so I got like three in today. There it is. But I do usually do five miles a day. Not a boy. The last like two weeks. Usually. Not a boy. Got it while it's nice out. Yeah, it's just, just so, yeah. What else is new? Anything? No. How about you? Mm, no. Oh, here's here's uh something. All right, ready? Ready. Uh, yeah, ready. Okay, let's see. <laughs> What's up, guys? Hey, up, man? Uh, how's it going? How are we doing? Uh, going pretty good. Going pretty good. Just talking shop. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I was just watching one of your guys' uh, podcasts on Facebook, and I think it was the first time that uh, Bill moved into his, oh, his, uh, the, his oh, area the re- down there. recent one. <laughs> yeah. Did you get through the beeps? <laughs> I, I got through the, the talking about the 10 to 20-minute bathroom session. Oh, Ooh, wow. oh yeah. that was a good one. We got a lot of hate on that one. <laughs> Only one person. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a, well, tough, that's a tough one. It's too bad that you, you know, you got on. Well, it's not too bad, but if you didn't get on as early as you did, I had a whole nother story because I, uh, I just actually got out of the shower for reasons we won't get into right now. But only because there's a lady on. Yeah, there's a lady <laughs> present. <laughs> I'm actually, lady present. Out. you guys don't need anything from me. Um, I'm gonna head out. Okay, it should be good. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, right, welcome. Now, you, now you can tell it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was just it was just your generic. I needed a shower after after a movement. Uh, welcome, Taylor, uh, <laughs> to the Simple Minds Sports Show. With us is Taylor. Uh, what's the best Rochester? Is that the best? I always screw up names, and uh, that's we're awesome. Terrible yeah, at names. So I uh, I'm always nervous to say it, but Rochester is correct, right? Rochester is correct. I've been living overseas for the last 12 years, so you couldn't botch it any worse than I've heard over the last 12 years. So you're good. Well, I, li- I watched a bunch of your highlights and uh, yeah, those, the, the announcers over there didn't help me. And then finally I got one interview uh, and then, you know, I saw some stuff from, from the uh, NCAA tournament and stuff. I was like, Oh, okay. Now that makes sense. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, those, those guys weren't very close They're I'm, I was better than them. That's for sure. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we appreciate you joining us. The new, the professional, obviously a professional, uh, you know, what is this, your 12th year as a professional basketball player, global yeah. professional basketball player, you could call it. Yep. Yep. Um, but you're joining us today as a brand new author of a book, 2020 uh, Vision. So we are happy for you to join us. Man, I'm, I'm excited for you guys uh, bringing me on. I'm looking forward to it. I wore some, some type of red because I know that you guys are. Boston, uh, uh-huh. Boston located. Uh-huh. Although I'm a big, I'm a big Dodger fan, but I'm showing some respect to you guys. Yeah, we gave you Mookie <laughs> Betts. You're welcome. All right, we got a World <laughs> Series out here. You can have Mookie. As soon as we got Mookie, that seemed to help. Yeah, shortened season. Let's be real here. You guys have not done <laughs> shit since the shortened season. All right, COVID is the reason you want a World Series, but that's a story for another day. 
Uh, wait, and- there, there are some, there are some, uh, you know, steal. I mean, they're stealing some signs. There's, it's up for debate. Well, Allegedly. welcome to Boston. That's what we do. Yeah. We cheat here to win championships. If you're not cheating, you're not winning. Yeah. <laughs> not in Boston. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. I think with Yogi Bear, that might have been what you were going for there. Yeah, sorry. Uh, smokes a lot. Um, <laughs> that's okay. If you're, yeah, Dodgers fan is fine. We got one out of you, and the Red Sox are dead to us anyway until they do better. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's completely fine. And LeBron sells a team. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Uh, that's that's enough hey let's let's do our due diligence here ray do you mind uh starting us off let's get into the book absolutely and then we got some basketball questions for you and uh awesome. you know if if you listen to any of that podcast you know that we're kind of an open book we'll, we can talk about anything you can say for, anything for as long as you want and you can yeah. say anything you want no one's listening anyway Perfect. so it doesn't really matter <laughs> <laughs> so your book how did it come about were you just born in quarantine and just said i need to do something i can't do anything right now i need, i have all these thoughts i need to write them down and that's how it all started like how did it all come about man well i've uh you know i haven't read a book since uh green eggs and ham and the club. Some, some of those books uh and, and that's now. one of the things i'm careful yeah I'm those trying. aren't allowed anymore you gotta be careful we might have to beep it. <laughs> yeah you're, I know. you're not in america right you're in france right now <laughs> i am I'm, I'm i'm keeping the distance i'm safe yeah you don't right he doesn't oh, know yeah, about dr right. seuss and all the cancellation of dr <laughs> seuss so. okay yeah i um you know i'm never a big reader never a writer um you know just always a, a athlete slash student instead of student slash athlete although i always you know did well in school and everything but that wasn't really my field and um uh, my wife was pregnant with our daughter about three years ago, and I had this idea to write down some some things and a vision that I had for her future. And uh, we're living in a pretty crazy world, uh, especially to raise kids um, when it comes to social media and how you view yourself and trying to promote positivity and have self-confidence. And you hear a lot about anxiety, especially now with athletes. Um, and so I just had this vision for her, and I wanted to – I took it like uh, I'm running a relay race, and I wanted to hand her the baton – and uh, for like a better world than, than I had, even though I grew up uh, and had a great childhood. But um, it started off just as a letter to her. It grew into a little bit more. I actually moved out to, t- uh, to China, and that's where she was born. Awesome. Um, and then I had a lot of time out there um, with traveling and being on the trains and planes and stuff like that. So I kind of developed it more and more. Um, and then it was just a bunch of throw up on a page. And then I came uh, home during quarantine. Um, and had some people help me um, look over the book and kind of put it into sections. And it slowly became a book. And then writing it was basically the easiest part. And then trying to publish it and get to know this literary world was super difficult for me because I've never you know, been in that world before. So it's been, it's been cool. It's been a lot of learning. Part of what I talk about in the book is learning new things, opening yourself up to the world, creating first. And so uh, just learning new things about the book, it's been, it's been really cool. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's a good lesson. I know you got another one question here ray but just listen to you there taylor like um coming from three guys who just during quarantine went hey we're bored you want to just start a quarantine or a you know a podcast, podcast yeah. it, the idea is just throw your ideas up against whatever you have and kind of see what comes out i think a lot of people get stuck before that step and are like well let me i gotta frame it in my mind and see what it makes sense and make it look and then like i've i've found just throw as much as you have in your head somewhere on paper or on video or whatever and then figure it out later and maybe you have something there. So I think not only is the book, which is not necessarily about that, a good lesson of positivity, but just what you said right there, I think it's something that's important for people to kind of take in. Yeah. My, my, my cousin kind of jumped on it. He said, Hey man, you know, I haven't read the book yet. It's before it came out. And he was just like, but it just, we all need to do more of that. Whether it's uh, taking photos and actually putting the date on the back, like they used to be when you went and got the photos yeah. printed out or, <laughs> yeah. or just write, writing down some fun memories that you have. My kids are crazy. So writing down things that they say, because I got a bad memory. I forget about it anyway, uh, later. And then I'm trying to remember. So just documenting parts of your life and then you can share it with your family, share it with friends, and it'll be fun to look back at it in 10, 15 years. Bill, you still have that microfiche machine or whatever from the 60s that you guys kept your records on, right? Yeah, I'm clicking away. Click. There you click. go. a boy. <laughs> so would you say that 2020 vision is a bigger achievement than your NBA, uh, your basketball career, playing professional for 12 years? It's definitely better uh, than my NBA career because I didn't have one. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I know. Sorry. sorry. That was read a, a book, right? Read a book. That yeah, was it was an a absolute book. cheap burn. <laughs> no, I apologize. Um, you know, I think, um, I think our accomplishments are in the journey and they're not in the, uh, you know, in the outcome of, of whatever we're working towards. Um, I talk in the book about, um, you know, succeeding in your 95% because everybody's focused on that 5%, you know, it's like, 
when the book comes out, man, I'll get these accolades and things will be great and people will know me and I'll have a book published. Uh, but the 95% is writing it, uh, developing my thoughts, creating authenticity with who I am and who I want my kids to be and uh, editing it and being vulnerable and having people help me out along the process and learning about this uh, crazy world of literature that I'm now a part of. And so um, I think that the goal was just the whole journey. And that's the way I've been for a long time, especially in basketball, where it's I'm not going to appreciate the season just because my team won the championship. I'm just going to have fun during the year or else I'm missing out on the whole purpose. Yeah. Is, is that literally literary, literary world? Is that like as competitive and cutthroat or is it just some like a whole different vocabulary that you have to learn? Like what, what were like your, what's the biggest hurdles that you're seeing there? I think the biggest thing is um, when I came out of college uh, I had to choose an agent, you know, uh, playing basketball. I didn't really know much about it. And it's kind of like throwing a dart on a board and seeing what happens because you might get the hype of that recruitment and everybody loves you and uh, everybody's going to do the best thing for you coming out of high school, going to colleges, you know, you go on those recruiting trips and it all sounds great. Your agent might take care of you, might not. And then, so I jumped in the literary world. And if you ask me about basketball, I can give you a bunch of advice. And then I get in this world. They're like, all right, what are you going to do next? Who's going to promote your book and who's going to do your social media and who's going to do this. And I was like, I don't know. I'm I'm mid season over here and I got a game tomorrow. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's just like, I don't really know what's going on. So you have to have a lot of faith. You have to trust some friends, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend connected me with this person. And they said, Hey, there's a guy named Taylor. He lives in LA. He's writing a book and I can connect you with his girlfriend and she can tell you about the process. I was like, this is not a good start. (laughs) (laughs) The guy's got the same name as me and his girlfriend's going to tell me about the book business. But the truth is she led me to a publicist. The publicist led me to an online business manager, led me to a virtual assistant and all of a sudden this team rallies around this book and the book was published and it's just it's just crazy like i said the process was everything how hard is it too now that you're overseas like you're trying to do everything i'm assuming it's all in america that like you're trying to get this published and all that how hard is it for you to be overseas and doing all that well i think you guys are seeing it right now you guys did something awesome you started this podcast and you and you're doing stuff like that because the world is virtual right now yeah. um i think if the world wasn't virtual Um, This would be a big hurdle that I'd have to get over. But since everything is virtual, I just signed on to be a speaker. Um, And I couldn't have done that before because businesses need you to give a keynote speech. You know, you're like, well, uh, I got a game on Saturday. I got one day off and I live in France. Uh, I'll try to make it, but probably not going to happen. So now I can do stuff virtually. Um, The book launch was virtual. Um, It's not as fun because you don't show up to the bookstore and see your book and just kind of get all that excitement. Just like sports, you got to have the fans in the, in the stands or else it's just kind of a different game. But uh, it's just been amazing. And thankfully, I can do it because of COVID and because of the pandemic. Speaking of, speaking of your book, uh, you mentioned one thing, cultivating joy. So I'm a miserable prick. <laughs> I'm probably the worst pers- miserable person I know. How would I go about cultivating some joy in my life? Well, first of all, I'm glad that I'm glad that you raised that question. I watched some podcasts and I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> I had a I had a similar question, worse. and I wanted you to go and speak on it too, because like cultivating joy for Bill is doing. Remember that meme that I just want to do hood rat things with my friends. That's Bill every day. That's <laughs> Bill. I'm out of work right now. What the fuck do you want from me? <laughs> no, I think I'm man, right. it's. It's, uh, it's really difficult. Um, one of the things you got to do is you got to be authentic. So you got to be who you are and you got to have authentic thoughts. And it's difficult because uh, we live in a, a world where uh, the world basically tells you how you're going to feel uh, before you form any thoughts yourself. So you wake up and the first thing you do is reach for your phone. Uh, you see how many likes you got on Instagram. You see if somebody texted you back, didn't text you back. Then you check the stock market if you're an investor and see the stocks are down. Then you see the weather report. Uh, you haven't, you don't even have the chance like our grandparents did or parents did where you can wait until you've had your coffee and open up your newspaper and you have some authenticity before that. And so the world is telling you how you, how you're going to feel. Oh man, it's, it's gloomy today. So, uh, it's probably not going to be a good day. And then we yeah. carry yesterday's vision into today and we forget about the potential of each day. So I call it a morning intake. So you wake up and it's hard for me because I got two small kids. I got to hit the alarm or wake up the baby and change the diaper, but you got to check in with yourself and um, not worry about what your phone's telling you and how that's going to affect you. And I say the, the internal affects the external and not the external affecting the internal. So it starts with the morning intake. 
and then it can really change your day. Then you, you write down stuff, you write down lists, you write down goals. Uh, when you have transitional moments in your day, you're like, hey, let me open up these lists, some things that I might want to do. I'm a really bad sleeper. That's kind of how this book started too. I writing some notes instead of just staring at the wall and being frustrated, you know, turn your frustrations and weaknesses into strengths. There's a bunch of different things you can do, but the, the, the best thing is you just start with that, that morning and you wake up, you're like, Hey, how do I feel? Like you said, I, I feel shitty every day. Well, okay. I feel shitty today, this morning. So what am I going to do today? How am I going to change that? How am I going to influence my life? If I can't influence my life. How am I going to influence somebody else's life? And um, you know, you have the power, especially through your smartphones and these devices where you can have a megaphone to promote positivity to everybody else. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is when you surround yourself with that positivity, when I started writing this book, I started following different people on social media. I started connecting with different people. I get excited about doing this podcast with you. It's because I, I wrote this book and it, and it gets me excited for the day. So I surround myself with those kind of things. And then now my, my feeds are flooded with all this positive content where I can't go one day without being surrounded by positivity. And um, if that's what you're letting in and that's what you're going to kind of embrace. Yeah, it's cool. It's interesting you say that we we've had that a little bit similar. We've interviewed a good number of people now and we've just, you know, we just haven't said no, obviously like who are we to say no was our initial take. And then we started meeting all these people that, really we had no business talking to it like there wasn't a huge <laughs> relationship to what we were talking about but you ended up you know they ended up being interesting or you know we interviewed some woman who does makeup in la it was like we had a blast Stop so hey, you guys had the pickleball champ the southern california oh pickleball yeah champ. pickleball yeah. Yeah, yeah. mike brandon was a cool dude man yeah he, he was awesome so and yeah. Yeah, yeah talk about positivity he he has another book out too you know in, in kind of a similar idea you guys are kind of yeah. on the same wavelength um, my, my question about that was in relation to your basketball career, which we kind of want to get into, but talk some hoops here, but do you think you would have been able to do this book? I mean, how much have you learned just through your basketball career? How much do you credit it to that? Or, or is a lot of where you grew up or what's the combination there? I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big time sports fan. So I'm a big time, uh, team sports guy too, um, where you just learn so much from sports, just being around sports, um, understanding the ups and downs of life, the wins and losses. Uh, you understand adversity and getting injured. You understand having to, you know, go over hurdles and having coaches that don't understand you or teammates you don't like or whatever it might be. And you just learn to work together and you, you can learn so much. Uh, and the biggest thing with sports is I've always known I wanted to play overseas. So I played in like 10 different countries and actually lived there instead of visited. So I talk about um, experiencing truths so you go around the world and experience these German kids are learning different things than American kids and Russian kids and French kids. And it just opens your mind to this whole other world. And so my basketball brought me over here. Um, I met my wife in France. I'm in France right now at our house where, where it just, I never would have been here unless sports brought this to me. And then just bringing all that into a book and then trying to bring the best of everything that I've learned and teach that to my kids. I mean, sports definitely brought all that for me. That's cool, man. That's really cool. Very cool. Like you said, though, too, like you've played all over the place. When you first went to Germany, how intimidating was that being like, all right, I'm going here. I don't I don't think you know all these languages because obviously you've been to Germany, <laughs> Turkey, Russia, Serbia, you know, France. You don't know all these languages. So how intimidating is that at first being like, I'm a professional player going to play overseas. I don't know anything here. I don't know anyone. Like, how was that first initial reaction? You know, I'm really lucky. I don't know how much you've talked with some some players that have gone overseas. It's super intimidating for, I think, a lot of people. Um, when I went over there, um, uh, I had a bunch of young Americans on my team. So it was almost like an extension from college and we weren't getting paid that much. So they gave us coins to go get dinner at this one restaurant. So we'd all be eating together every night and basically having lunch together every day. And it was, it was just like going to the, the round table in college and, you know, eating with all the other athletes. And so it was a really unique experience for me. And I'm happy I had that at first because some people come out here, they're like, oh man, Europe's such a grind. And it was so tough. And I was counting down every day to come home immediately. When I came out here, I fell in love with, um, the fans, um, the excitement, the atmosphere, the different cultures. And I, I immediately just hit the ground running and had a good successful season. And, uh, we just all played for each other and nobody was worried about the money and all that kind of stuff. And so it was a really fortunate situation for me. Definitely. Uh, and my agent had a great vision. He told me right when we started working together, I played for the Lakers summer league. And he said, hey, I want you to go play in Germany. I got a guy there. It's really great for young uh, Americans to show, especially guards, to show uh, their pace of play and show how they can do stuff. And so he said I was going to go there. I said, cool. 
and uh, trusted him and ended up having a great career over here. That's awesome. Speaking of that, how does the contracts work? Because, you know, kind of looking you up, it looked like you pay for 10 or 12 different teams. You know, it seems like you only sign like, you know, one year deals. Is that like the norm or is it you just kind of you'd like to travel to a shit ton of different countries? Uh, it's a combination of both. I always kind of wanted to change things up. Um, I, I graduated, I think, sixth grade. And I said, hey, when I when I'm older, I want to play college basketball and go play in Europe. I didn't even know they had European leagues, but I just I, I knew I wanted to travel the world and play basketball um it's tougher for americans out here we're a dime a dozen especially guards there's a thousand thousands of us that are trying to come out here and play and so you got to be thankful for your situation uh and you got to realize that uh, you're kind of a almost like a nobody uh and so if you're not doing it somebody will replace you and on the other side these teams are signing you and they're like all right we're gonna lowball you at first because there's all the other guys that want to come here and so if you go play for a team and you play well, well, then you can kind of move up. If you're kind of average, they might try to say, okay, well, you know, do you want to come back? Do you not want to come back? And normally you have a really good season or you have an okay season. If you have an okay, they might try to find a new piece and bring a new piece in. If you do great, maybe they can't offer you. And then, so they have a lot of domestic players uh, that they hold on to their team and kind of the core of their team. Cause you can only have so many uh, uh, U S players. And so there's a lot shorter contracts for the Americans normally, these Europeans are signing three, four year deals to stay in one team or whatever it might be. So if you're lucky, you can be on one of the top teams and sign a couple year deal. The couple times that I've signed uh, more than one year deals, they only last one year. So you can take that for what it is. Either, either they didn't like me or I, you know, I didn't like them or it wasn't a good fit, but I love the fact that I can change around. It's changed now that I have a family and I wish I could have stayed in, the, in a spot for a long time so they could have friends and go to school and all that kind of stuff. But it's been a great ride. Help me write the book. Did, did you have a, did you end up having a favorite? I mean, you averaged, what was it? 33 in the, in, in China. So the, I mean, was that, yeah. the, was that the league or was that you? Were you just, were you just feeling it that year? The Chinese league is definitely different. It's a lot like um, the NBA. Just imagine, imagine mm-hmm. like kind of like the D league, uh, but you have two players on each team that are like NBA guys. Yeah. And then the rest of them are D league players. And then they're featuring the NBA guys. So over there you have two Americans on your team. You can't play together in the fourth quarter what? or in the first or second quarter. Whoa. And so what? That's, I did when, not know when, this. Yeah, whoa, that's crazy. this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. So you can, you can play together two quarters. You can choose in between the one, two, three, who's going to, you know, who's going to play when in the fourth quarter, you can only play one. And so Every, almost every place for you, there's guys out there that are scoring 70 points in one game, but they might score 20 in the next game. So you, there's guys scoring 30 points a game and getting cut because their team's not winning. And um, I played for a team I kind of had to do everything. And, uh, you know, and they like me out there because I'm one of the only Americans that likes to pass uh, that plays in China because <laughs> you, you're brought over to score so many points. But it's right. definitely different than Europe. And what a lot of Americans don't understand when they're watching Luka Doncic and people like this these guys were averaging 13 points a game in Europe, 14 points a game, and they're the MVP of EuroLeague. It's difficult in Europe. It's uh, shorter games. Um, it's uh, different defenses, different rules, uh, yeah. different scouting, and every game's different. So uh, it's just it's been unique. Every different country has a different style. Is it weird too if you think about the Euro leagues? You can play like Luka Doncic was playing where like at thirteen or fourteen, like pro. Oh. Like, is that weird? Like, you're playing, you know, you're playing professional basketball, and you're essentially playing with some kids. Like, I, I same thing with the Gasol brothers. We're playing fifteen, sixteen years old in the the Spanish leagues. So it's like, is that weird? You know, it's it's interesting. Normally, those young guys they 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 don't get much play uh, at the beginning. Luca was a was a different type of guy, and he actually got a lot more playing time because their starting point guard was hurt for the season or for most of the season. So he really stepped in as that point guard where he probably would have been like the two guard. So it was a way for him to shine. The young guys get a little bit of uh, get a little bit of burn, and they usually they try to shelter them a little bit, try to not make them look bad. Sometimes, not that they are bad but that they're, they're just vulnerable and the younger they're playing against bigger guys and it's very physical league. Um, but Luca was kind of a star when he was younger. I played with a uh, dragon bender. I don't oh, know if yeah. you know that name. Oh, yeah. 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 So he was my, he was my roommate uh, in, in uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv when we were on the road and um, he didn't really play in the Euroleague games. Um, and he played a little bit in the Israeli games and then he went number four in the draft. Um, so it's it's a uh, it depends on where you are and what's going on. Uh, Pokashevsky is having some great games over there right now. I played with him in Greece uh, for the team that I'm uh, wearing right now, and 
he was a good kid. He was playing with our junior team and now he's got a couple double doubles in a row in the, you know, in the NBA, it's just a different style of play. And they take a lot of players with potential length yeah. and um, young guys that they can try to develop. Well, it's more polished too, right? Cause you're, you're thinking you're getting more experience at the pro level instead of going to college for two, three years, you know, you're actually playing against pros, European pros, but you're still playing against pro not a bunch of college kids. So you get a lot more experience. Yeah. Not only that, but you're, you're playing against, um, the toughness of everyday practice too, where out here practice in these games are, are, that's the biggest difference for me between Europe and America is just every day is the most important day for a lot of these coaches. Um, they're taking every day seriously and they're banging each other in practice as well. So, um, you know, they're getting, they're getting good physical practice by the time they're 15, 16, 17 years old with, uh, you know, vets, most of them that have played in the NBA and, you know, can teach them a thing or two. And these coaches really teach a lot of skill out here and do a lot of development. So it's good for them. Yeah. Uh, your career, you've had quite a career. I mean, all Pac-10, uh, you've been league MVP, Final Four MVP. Oh, boy. Here, you know, come, here comes the uh, resume. Yeah, but what's left to, for you to accomplish? I mean, you've done it all. What, what what do you have left? Is there some goal that you have in mind that you're like, all right, if I reach this, then I'm I'm, I'm good. I can call it a career. Actually, did, and well, sorry to interrupt, uh, Taylor, I w- did you ever have a thought to try and get back to the NBA? Or did you, or did you like that what you were doing so much that like this, you just – enjoyed it was the idea of ever trying to get back a a thought process or did you kind of have your that that's a tricky one i think i think if i had um if i I had a contract on the table that was like hey sign this contract you're gonna play in the nba for two three years i would have signed it i would have gone and played in the nba i think i would have been um dumb not to in in a couple of different ways but um the authentic person that i am is uh, and i write about in the book is i'm a fourth quarter player and so I like, I like the ball in my hands. I like at the end of the game that people are looking to me to make the final, you know, play, whether it's a pass or a shot. Um, and you, you put that into life. I want to be there in the important moments. I want to be there with the birth of my kids. I want to be there when people need me. I want to be there. I want to be impactful in the good moments. So <clears throat> I'm a, I realized that if I was coming to the league, for the most part, unless, like I said, I had that contract where I say, hey, we're going to give you this time to come over here and develop. I wasn't going to come over there and bounce back and forth from the, the uh, G League or um, come up to the NBA just to say that I played in the NBA um, because I'm having too much fun with my experiences overseas. Um, my wife is European, so now I'm close to family out here. And before the pandemic, you know, family and friends were coming to visit us all the time. And these life experiences are second to none. And that idea of, of uh, trying to make it in the NBA – Uh, I was excited about it maybe when I was a little younger and I would have taken the chance, but uh, I never really pursued it. One year I had a really great opportunity to come um, try out for a couple teams that were going to fly in to see me specifically after my best season overseas. Um, And I was driving with my wife to Paris. Uh, I had a dream the night before that I was looking for something, looking for something at the end of the dream. I opened up this box and it was a contract to go sign in Israel. And so I took that as a sign. And then I talked to her and she said, Hey, you know, this is what you've been building for. And this would be a great experience. We can go over here and have a great time instead of trying to worry about the, the politics or trying to sit on the bench and trying to get yeah. some minutes. You know, I worked so hard to get there that I wanted to enjoy every moment and tomorrow's not promised. So if I'm going to stop playing, um, how do, how do I want that to play out? You know, if I get hurt tomorrow, what would I say? And I've met a lot of ex NBA players, um, that were either sitting on the bench or some of them, it took the love out of the game for them. And, they dealt with uh, different things in the NBA. So um, I think if I had that great opportunity again, I probably would have taken it. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, how can I, Yeah. I, there's no, there's no regrets. I've had these great experiences. So that's, not much to awesome. say. Do you ever come back for good or are you just staying in France forever? Like is, can, does it pay enough in the Euro leagues to kind of like live on after your career or is you got to shift gears after this? Um, I hope I never stop working. I think I got that from my mom and dad. I think they're, they're just gonna, they're just gonna continue to work. Uh, my wife's family too. They have this amazing, huge farm out here. Um, and oh, nice. you know, her, her, her grandpa is out in the field till 8 PM and comes in, forgets something, he goes back out there in the field. And oh, so wow. it's just like, if I'm not working, I'm, you know, I'm starting to die. So, uh, I, I just want to be active and continue to do stuff and open my mind to different things, but you can definitely, uh, make the, make enough money um, to kind of do your own thing and pivot into something else. I've already pivoted in this book and I'm actually coming back to the States a week from today. I left my team kind of builds into this authentic person of kind of who I am. I left my team because they were unable to join me, um, because they closed the airports in Israel. So I actually left my team to be with my wife and kids here in France. 
And then we decided to go back to the States and just have a long, uh, long summer until we're probably going to go back to China next year. So we're just trying to figure out how everything goes and just see where life takes us. And everybody had a lot of plans at the start of 2020 yeah. and things yeah. changed. Oh, yeah. I got a plan for you as Celtics fans and you being a fourth quarter player with the ball in your hands. You want to contract the same for thing. Boston? Yes. Yeah. They suck. We'll, they we'll send this, we'll send this resume yeah. to Danny yeah. Age. Well, we got you. We got you. <laughs> we need a veteran bench guy badly. <laughs> well, I can, I can guarantee I can help any team on and off the court. So uh, if you guys can make that connection, I'll be there. All right. Well, we're not promising anything, but we'll try. <laughs> no, but are you, uh, are, go, go ahead, ahead Rick. Uh, speaking of March, I mean, it's March Madness time, and these two dummies don't agree with me. Is March Madness the most exciting tournament that you can watch for a basketball player? I think it's the best sports event, period. Mm-hmm. Um, it was nice talking besides, to you. <laughs> besides, besides, besides the World Cup, um, yeah. because once you've lived overseas, soccer is for sure the number oh, one God. sport. Yeah. Um, and my wife is French. They won a lot, you know, they won the world cup. This is cup, my fucking uh, guy right here. This is my guy. So, this is really digging a hole for us, Taylor. This yeah, is a, you, this is, this, this is where it's at, but the NCAA tournament, the, I hate to say the word innocence, but the, the excitement, I mean, you just look at the bench um, yeah. of the players that are playing. I've played in the NCAA tournament myself. Um, and the feeling that everybody, almost everybody, especially sports fans, are player people that went to college in one form or another or went to high school and played for some type of team or has a family member that played for some type of team, has some connection to some type of school. So there's these connections that are just so deep. Uh, and it's just exciting. I mean, there anything is possible. It's just one game. Um, a lot of times um, you just need to be the right team at the right time. The Cinderella stories, everybody can kind of connect with, uh, with these stories. And it's really, really fun. Yeah, yeah, but then someone turns the ball over like Rutgers last night, and you're like, dude, just hold on to the ball. Come on. It's like, just just run the play, get the layup, you'll but be they're fine. Kids. Everyone they're loses kids. their damn mind. March Madness is, uh, is, is, is fun. Bill is an idiot. March Madness is amazing <laughs> because, of, because of the excitement. The college game uh, frustrates me a little bit because of, how, because of how chaotic it can get at times, especially mm. towards the end there. But well, you, your Washington, that was the last team to make the tournament for, for your collegiate career, correct? Was that? Yeah, that was you want to talk. You want to talk about a, a a great story and why NCAA basketball is so great. If you look at uh, Tony <laughs> Bennett, is Tony Bennett was my coach in college, and so I flew to um, where was it? I flew to Louisville to go watch him in the Sweet Sixteen and Elite Eight uh, the year they won the NCAA tournament. I had to fly back to France to take care of my two kids, and I missed <laughs> him winning the national championship. But the year before, uh, he was the first one seed to get knocked out. And he comes back with his team and wins the NCAA tournament in crazy fashion. And ever the end of all those games were absolutely out of control. Um, and so it's just, it's as good as it gets. And there are stories like that. And there's probably going to be a movie coming out in 10, 15 years. I'll be excited to watch. <laughs> fine. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. We'll take a word for it. All right. Look, we've taken up a lot of your time. We appreciate it. Um, we'll, we'll give you the floor here to... Where can we find the book? I mean, it's first of all, it's a number one bestseller on Amazon. It's number two in Forbes as of a week ago, probably number one now, number two in Wall Street. I mean, it's it's moving up the charts, so it's not hard to find. But um, the floor is yours. Where where's the easiest place to get it? Where should we be looking for it? I didn't know I had a copy, but here's here's what the book looks like. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm trying to learn to do more of that. I'm really bad at that. Uh, I love uh, the the attention of being a point guard and leading, but uh, talking about myself has never been a it's hard thing, so man. learning, yeah, it, learning it's, to do better it, at that it, it's yeah you have to like turn off your self-awareness for just a little bit and be like i'm awesome check me out <laughs> but uh amazon um just type in type in my last name rochesty uh you'll see a new 2020 vision on amazon it's on barnes and noble it's on kobo which i just learned about uh recently um and um yeah, or you can just find me on social media and just say, hey, how do I get this book? And uh, I'm posting lots of lots of stuff about the book, some great content, just uh, about positivity, about life and trying to connect with people. And that's that's been amazing. Some people have really reached out to me and s- talked about the book and told me how it uh, affected them and asked me some uh, advice about some certain things. And that's just been amazing. So I can shift uh, from that mind of basketball to really uh, creating that positivity for people. So Bill, uh, anytime, man. Just let me know. <laughs> yeah, Bill, if you if you go on Twitter, if you look closely, that tiny, tiny speck of light in that 
dark haze of yep. terribleness social media is about, that's Taylor. Just, right. just curb oh, search. Man. I'll check. I'll, I'm going to add you on all platforms. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, positivity. Uh, we appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. Um, good luck. Enjoy your time back with your family, and good luck with the rest, with the book. And, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Hey, it's been a blast, yeah, you guys. You. I, uh, I love what you guys are doing. Keep doing it, and I'll be following. Appreciate it. Awesome, appreciate man. Thank it. you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Positivity, Bill. A moment of clarity in the morning. When it's you my morning shit. I actually do like that. I was I had a good run there. <laughs> That's for, my morning. <laughs> I uh, I didn't bring my phone in for the morning, for the morning business. Oh, I brought a book. I brought a book in. Ooh, ooh, good for you. You're a phone guy, Bill. Always a phone. Hell yeah, yeah, no. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's that's the habit for sure, but. It's better. When I went to my psychiatrist for my problems, uh, they said, like, that's part of the problem is you were on your phone way too much. Like, uh, anger, actually. (laughs) Okay. We're all related. (laughs) Yeah. It's all the same. It is. No, yeah. yeah, They're like, it's no, they they say it's like a lady box. Yeah, that's all it is. It's a dick measuring box. That's all that is. Mm -hmm. And I lose every time. Oh, always. Look how big that thing is. Baby.